KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. It is 1.30. Stay tuned next for Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. The rebels, the Sudan Liberation Army, wants to change the government. I mean, radical reform slash revolution. Any hope that... There will be an enduring peace in Darfur that people will be able to return to their homes. It's beginning to fade, and that's making people a lot more desperate. But this is really all that people were fighting for. Roads, schools, health care, clean water, things like that. It's been five years of genocide in Darfur. 300,000 lives have been lost, and millions have been displaced. While the UN says lack of security has prevented the full deployment of a peacekeeping force... Even Hollywood stars have taken on the cause. On this edition, we'll hear what it's like to embed with rebels in Darfur who say they're fighting for political and economic rights. I'm Andrew Stelzer, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. Have you ever embarked on a journey not quite knowing what to expect? Not quite knowing how you'll get there, or even if you will safely return? Well, that's kind of what journalists and activists Shane Bauer and David Martinez did when they took off to make a film in Darfur. Correspondent Pauline Bartoloni has their story. The two filmmakers took off to the war-torn region in the summer of 2007. They were equipped only with a couple of backpacks, Bauer's Arab language skills, and Martinez's video camera. Their plan was to embed with armed rebels in Darfur and tell a different story of the conflict. They're basically singing, John Juid, get rid of your weapons. I love Jebel Mara. Jebel Mara is a, a mountain in the central of Darfur. It's where the rebel movement started, and it's also the kind of heart of black Darfur. A lot of civilians were killed on Jebel Mara. <laughs> My name is Shane Bauer. I'm a freelance journalist and photographer. My name is David Martinez. I live in San Francisco, California. I make movies. I write journalism. I make a living sometimes. And I went to Darfur in large part because I wasn't satisfied with how the conflict was being covered and partially that there was very little coverage. We wanted to make a film that talked more about the political economy of what's going on in Darfur. What I was hearing, a lot of it came from refugee camps, you know, making people seem pretty abject, and I felt like there was a huge part missing. In the spring of 2007, Vanity Fair came out with an Africa issue. And there was a series of covers, but there was one in particular that I saved, which has a picture of Brad Pitt and Desmond Tutu. And Brad Pitt is situated in the front with this very concerned look on his face, and Desmond Tutu is behind him with his hands on his shoulders, almost as if to say, Brad, you and the Hollywood liberals have to go save Africa for us. And it was this very patronizing, and Brad Pitt is wearing this sort of military T-shirt, and he's looking very concerned and looking off in the distance like he has a great burden upon his shoulders that is, of course, being placed there by Desmond Tutu. And I think that exemplified the way the West views Africa as like, we have to go do something. And so I think that's what we were trying to do with this movie as well, is here's some Africans helping themselves. The goal of this trip was to make a documentary film with the plan to go to Chad and enter Darfur through Chad across the border with rebel groups and kind of embed with rebel groups in Darfur and film their daily life. Shane Bauer had studied the crisis in Darfur at UC Berkeley and had made a trip to the region in 2006. So with Bauer's contacts from his first trip, the two flew to Chad and searched for a way into Darfur, hoping to get access to the Sudanese Liberation Army, or the SLA. Their first stop? A refugee camp on the chad Sudan border. I believe the technical term for this sort of place is a one-horse town. It's really small. And probably had a population of no more than 1,000 or 1,500. But right next to it is a gigantic refugee camp with about 30,000 people. It wasn't really very difficult to meet some people who knew some people who knew some some fighters in the Sudan Liberation Army. And we arranged it to, to go in. And, and part of the 
one of the things we were very specific about when we called them was, you have to get us out. We'll get ourselves in, but you all have to get us out. Because what had changed since Shane was there was that some of the Sudan Liberation Army, that the SLA factions, one of them in particular had signed an agreement, a peace agreement with the government, and had since been acting as proxy soldiers for the government, and at least so much as uh, as they had grabbed a couple of journalists that we knew, including our friend Ethan, and had turned him over to the Sudanese government, where he got imprisoned and all his stuff taken needless to say we didn't want this to happen to us and the rebels that we talked to the sla that we talked to assured us no problem we'll get you out going in we hired a civilian vehicle to drive us in we had one sla guy to kind of get us there um and he was unarmed and shortly after we crossed the border into sudan we were stopped uh, by another rebel faction we pulled into this sort of scrub forest area and all these men just uh, appeared out of the scrub wearing turbans and carrying different rifles and stuff and um, there was some armed group and we waved to them and honked and they came over and talked to us and then more men came out and trucks started to appear with rockets hanging off them and giant machine guns w- bolted in the back and this turned out to be a completely different rebel group they kind of took us out of the car and questioned us and it was we we didn't expect that they would be there and we didn't expect that if we had seen them, they would cause us any trouble. But we have this guy Abdullah with us, who's an active rebel. And by the way he was dressed, it's fairly obvious he's wearing sort of vaguely camouflaged military outfit. And out come some other guys in military outfits with the yellow scarves. And okay, who are you? Which group are you with? This is with the SLA. And so they take our satellite phone and say, we're going to look at the numbers you guys called and check them against the numbers we know of the different SLA factions. And if you were talking to the wrong faction meaning the faction that's working with the government, you all are fine, but he's in trouble. And they looked at our satellite phone, see what numbers we called. They called the numbers that were on there to find out who the commander was of this guy. In the end, they um, found out he was okay, and they gave us tea and drove us out. I mean, I was still getting my legs. This is my first encounter with people like the people we were about to spend a lot of time with. And they were very accommodating. They said, you shouldn't look at this like you're being held prisoner. I was like, but come on. You know, it's like all these people with guns around you, like saying, "Can you? St- can you, you need to wait here and don't turn your camera on." It's like, so then we are being held prisoner, basically. <laughs> <laughs> while while it was happening, we're sitting under a tree. I remember sitting there thinking, like, this is typical of the situation now. It's like there's all these different groups, and their alliances are like shifting all the time. And and those two groups had been strongly allied six months before that, and the real tension is between these groups and the group that did sign, which is a part of the government now. So all of this factioning kind of revolves around this group signing a peace agreement. Back in May 2006, a faction of the SLA signed a peace agreement with the government. Since that time, there's been more violence and displacement in Darfur. Fighting exists between the signatory and non-signatory rebel factions, but also between the government and the rebels. Bauer and Martinez saw destroyed villages and markets, but most of their time was spent around the camps of the rebel group, the Sudanese Liberation Army. It's a man's world when you're living with these guys. Most of them were from somewhere in the region, in North Darfur, but by no means all. We'd sleep outside on plastic mats with blankets because it got a little bit cool at night. And sometimes there'd be, sometimes we'd set up a mosquito net when the mosquitoes got bad. And in the morning you'd get up with the dawn because right as soon as the sun rises, flies start swarming around you. And uh, everyone makes tea and we would eat twice a day and it was usually the same thing, which is called acida, which is boiled sorghum with a gravy on top of it. Um, so we'd get up in the morning, every everybody made tea drink the tea, they would pray, and then it would be midday, and in the heat of the day, you, you'd wait out the heat of the day somewhere, and then when it got cooler, you'd maybe go visit somebody else, and then so we were constantly moving. Really, a lot of our, the time we spent there was, I mean, just hanging out on the, their camps. Um, they had these, like, camps just kind of set up outside of towns um, with all their, you know, trucks and weapons, and um, most of what they do is hang around, play cards, play games, make tea, drink tea, talk, joke. I mean, I can't say that all of the time that we spent there was 
was representative of everything they do. I mean, they they attack too. They attack the government, and vehicles were coming going as we were there. We don't know what they were doing, where they were going. <laughs> When we were around the rebel bases, people would throw a sing at night. Usually when they really get into it, everybody would stand up and standing up near the fire, clapping and moving around a lot, swinging back and forth as they sang, and sometimes people would start dancing, jumping around. Bear in mind there's supposed to be a whole other part of that song that's sung by women. It's, it's occupying the tenor. Those guys are occupying the baritone and bass. There's supposed to be a tenor of women. And every person makes one sound over and over and over, repeats one sound. And when you combine all of these sounds, it makes, you know, this melody. And they would often, like, end the song breaking down, kind of laughing and clapping, and then, and then they started doing this dance where they literally were jumping around and jumping around in the firelight. Over a period of several weeks, Bauer and Martinez in bed with two different rebel factions. For their film, Bauer asked the fighters their personal stories and what they were fighting for. Most of them wanted international intervention and an equal share of Sudan's infrastructure and resources. Near a dry riverbed in a rebel camp outside a town called Giza, Bauer talked to a commander of one of the rebel factions. His name was Ali Mukhtar Ali, and um, he was the third in command of one of the rebel factions. He thinks, like everybody, that intervention needs to happen in Darfur, that intervention needs to happen so civilians can be protected, um, because right now a lot of what the rebels are doing is protecting civilians. We want to stop the killing, but the government won't bind by its promises. Even if the international community stopped the killing and we were able to live in safety and security, we have demands. Sudan is a nation with natural resources and we should be able to benefit from them. At the end of our interview, the, his last words were him saying, I have rights and needs that I cannot forget. When those things are present, then we'll talk about security and stability. If I accepted peace and security and the government comes back to kill me, what am I going to do? Once we get our rights and economic justice, then we'll talk about peace and security. He's representing a pretty popular sentiment with, about peace agreements with the government, is, which is nobody, nobody has any faith that they can even have an agreement with the government, um, that it's ever going to work. You know, So the point where most people are is that you know, we're not going to get anywhere until this government is gone and we form a new government. And that's, I mean, they, what they, their demands are essentially for a whole other system in Sudan. They want, like, a federal system where regions have more autonomy, they have more power, and it's not just a central government. The people hurt most in the Darfur crisis are civilians. Two-thirds of Darfuris are dependent on humanitarian assistance to survive. One million remain in their villages in constant threat of attack from the government, who seeks to destroy the rebel movement. Bauer says the civilians he talked to supported the rebels, but some are getting disillusioned with the factioning of their movement. In a small camp of internally displaced people, Bauer talked to civilian leader Umda Hamid Mana. I asked him if he thought it was wrong that the movement took up arms, and the reason I asked this is because because civilians are being killed because the government's trying to attack the rebels. I mean, if the rebels hadn't rose up, there, this war wouldn't have happened. And so when I asked him this, he, he said, no, it's not, it's not wrong. They took up arms. Um, they took up arms because we we're oppressed. And he went on to um, talk about what they don't have that they deserve and are for. <laughs> Sudan is the biggest country in Africa with vast oil resources. However, 70% of this revenue is used to fund the military. People outside the capital don't see much of the wealth. After a few weeks in Darfur talking to villagers and rebels, 
It was time for Martinez and Bauer to catch their flight back to the States. They waited in a market for five days for rebels to pick them up and bring them back to Chad. But they never showed up. The only vehicle that we could get out of Birmaza was a guy with a horse and a cart named Ahmet. How long will it take? Oh, three days, five days, something like that. It wound up taking seven. But it wound up being one of the most interesting parts of the trip because we traversed this, what felt like a really long distance, over seven days of walking and riding in a cart and stopping in villages. And we camped with camel herders. And uh, and we sort of snuck from village to village and stayed way off the roads. <laughs> This was when we were riding on a horse and cart back to Chad. Um, we've been riding for several days at that point, and it was just kind of in the late morning before it was so hot that the three of us couldn't stand each other. <laughs> and, um, he was just kind of singing along um, to himself, and uh, he would sing about the Janjaweed and the government, and then he would sing about, like, riding the horse and he'd sing about us and about our trip and all this stuff and he was a real countryman he could do everything like make fires find water and on the way and he knew everyone and we just plodded along and every time we asked um every time we asked him how long will it be till we're in chad he would say you should only ask of god that you arrive safely and in good health you should never ask God when you're going to get anywhere, and which is a convenient way of saying he didn't know. David Martinez and Shane Bauer made it back to Chad within hours of their flight back to the States. Their first-hand account into the conflict gave them insight about war-torn Darfur. The role of racism was different than I expected. It was It plays a role, just not the role that everyone thinks. People put it as the main reason for the war, and it is a big reason. I think that's why the violence against the Darfuris was so extreme, but it's not the reason that violence was enacted. I would say the base of the conflict is political and economic. Darfur has been marginalized since Sudan won independence from the British. Not only do they not have much political participation, but they've increasingly had less. They want to have basic services in Sudan. They want to have um, schools and clinics and roads and electricity, and they want to share political power. And until there's this kind of some sort of equality throughout the whole country, the problem isn't going to end. It's the same war, just happening in different regions. The base of the conflict in Darfur is about the injustices in the Sudan and about this despotic central government that that keeps all the power and wealth of a powerful wealthy country to itself to not just one region but certain tribes and families within that region it's a bit of a i guess it's plutocracy is the way to put it the rebels the sudan liberation army wants to change the government i mean i mean radical reform slash revolution like we need it has to be a different setup and completely different people because we we cannot work with these people and racism is absolutely a part of what is happening in darfur but it's not that simple. It's not a. It's not tribally based conflict, um, especially within Darfur. On a national level, there are you know some racial motivations, but within Darfur, it doesn't break down to Arabs versus blacks. I mean, there's a lot of Arabs in the rebel movements um, that are fighting the Arab government um, for the same reasons that blacks are fighting them. It's I mean because they're politically and economically marginalized. They want basic things like roads, schools, health care, and clean water. They repeatedly said that. So even if international pressure stops them or the UN comes in and stops the Sudanese government from attacking civilians, it won't necessarily advance the causes that would lead to real significant long-term change because that will be sort of atrophied and they will be still forced to deal with the Sudanese government. And so in a, in a, in a way that empowers the Sudanese government and people that, that should really be all locked up. Everybody in Darfur wants intervention and it's understandable. It, probably won't stop all of the violence in Darfur. I doubt it will, but it will stop the government from bombing their villages at, at the very least. There's other kinds of intervention we could do um, in Africa and in Sudan. I mean, you could not have the World Bank and IMF have anything to do with Africa. That would be one kind of intervention. Um, people sort of jump to the conclusion that military intervention is the only thing that will work, and I argue for an intervention 
a different kind of intervention, a broader intervention that that addresses the problems that caused this in the first place. And um, that's the kind of intervention I would like to see, not just an intervention that happens only when things get to such a dire situation that we have to start thinking about tanks and troops and things like that. Now, that said, if indeed that is the only way to stop the genocide in Darfur, maybe it has to happen. Most of what needs to happen in Darfur is is internal within Sudan. There needs to be a political agreement that people are satisfied with. And, I mean, how that's going to come about is going to be between the different parties in Sudan. Shane Bauer and David Martinez, activists and journalists from the San Francisco Bay Area. Their film about the rebel movement in Darfur, called Songs to Enemies in Deserts, will be released in 2009. For Making Contact, I'm Pauline Bartoloni. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. You can also download programs or get our podcast at radioproject.org. Despite a peace agreement and the presence of a small international peacekeeping force, violence in Darfur continues. To find out why, we spoke with Selena Brewer, Darfur researcher for Human Rights Watch. We began by asking her about the filmmakers we heard from earlier in the program and their assertion that although the popular media often characterizes the conflict as Arabs killing blacks, when they were in Darfur, they instead saw a conflict started over economic and political right. I think there has been a history of oversimplifying the situation in Darfur, as they said, as Arab versus African or as some kind of religious or tribal conflict. And it's simply not the case. It is a, a conflict between a multitude of different groups with different agendas. And you know, the issue is about marginalization and about access to political power. Now, uh, it's been five years uh, since the beginning of the conflict, and you were a humanitarian worker in the region in 2005. To the best of your knowledge, what is daily life like for a civilian on the ground now? H how has it changed since then? Um, although it's hard to define the precise ways in which it's different, it's the atmosphere that, that has changed. It's the effect of five years of living in an IDP camp of not being able to return to your home, of being under threat of violence if you leave the camp. And that has a major impact on the sort of social fabric as well as on the, the hopes and expectations of people. You know, any hope that there will be an enduring peace in Darfur, that people will be able to return to their homes, is beginning to fade. And that's making people a lot more desperate about their situation. And, of course, there's a physical impact of living like this for five years. You know, the impact of living on restricted rations in an environment that's very unhealthy and, and has a big impact on the social fabric. Now, as we speak, uh, there's a debate taking place around the uh, International Criminal Court's proposed indictment against Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir. Several members of the UN want that indictment suspended. They think it's going to damage... Uh, potential ceasefire and potential for a lasting peace process, but others say that would permanently damage the ICC's credibility in the long term and would lead to decreased accountability for war criminals around the world in the future. What are your thoughts about the situation and, and what should the international community's priorities be here? Um, yeah, it, it is. It's, a, it's an interesting and quite complicated debate in the, the countries that you normally hear coming out firmly in support of the International Criminal Court and of their work in countries like Darfur haven't been as strong in support of it as we'd like them to be because they have raised these concerns that if the prosecutions go ahead that Khartoum will either react with violent retaliation against peacekeepers or humanitarians on the ground or that it will somehow jeopardise progress that we're making on the ground, you know, moves towards peace talks, moves towards deployment of the peacekeepers. Um, I mean, you can have that debate, but the problem is 
in Sudan, if you talk just from a purely pragmatic perspective, Sudan has made these commitments time and time again over the last five years that they'll cooperate with the deployment of peacekeepers, that they'll respect a ceasefire, that they'll stop attacking villages, and they've just never followed through on those commitments. So to trade away justice in this way in return for what is essentially empty promises would seriously undermine the cause of international justice, and it would just be a false bargain. You wouldn't get what you expect in return. Right now, the UN and African Union force in the region, why isn't it working? Um, well, the, the uh, African Union United Nations peacekeeping force that's there now is actually a lot of the same troops that were there in 2004, 2005, as the African Union. They were rehatted and became this hybrid force with the expectation that an additional, I think, 19,000 troops would be deployed on top of the 7,000 that were already there. Unfortunately, very few of those additional troops have been sent. This is partly because of bureaucratic problems within the United Nations, and it's also very much linked to intentional obstruction by the government of Sudan, who really threw up endless bureaucratic hurdles to getting these troops deployed. So the end result is instead of 26,000 well-equipped troops, you've got 10,000 troops with very little in terms of equipment, no helicopters, very few personnel carriers, many of which are essentially obsolete. And they are having enormous problems in trying to function in this environment. But in addition to all of that, they're also under direct attack themselves. This is by government forces, by rebels, by bandits. And there have been a spate of attacks against the peacekeepers going back throughout the course of this year, and that's making their job even more impossible. And so what other types of intervention are possible? Well, a few things have been tried on Sudan. The U.S. and the United Nations have imposed targeted sanctions on individuals, for example. There's been an awful lot of periodic diplomatic pressure on the government to rein in their abuses, to disarm the militia, to stop attacking civilians. And that has come in fits and starts, but there hasn't been consistent pressure. So, for example, the United Nations imposed sanctions on four individuals. Those have never been implemented, and there's been no consequences for that. And our position is that it's useful to do these things, but it's only really effective if you actually follow through and you have some kind of sustained engagement, and that's what we want to see more of. And so, moving forward, what kind of hope for peace do you see uh, on the ground right now and in the at least the near-term future? Well, there's been some sort of promising statements by the government of Sudan and by some rebels saying that you know they are prepared to attend peace talks and that they are prepared to take steps that could lead towards sensible peace negotiations. The problem is for the time being this is all words. So what we need to see is them actually implemented on the ground. You know, the government of Sudan has, has declared a ceasefire but unfortunately, within three or four days, they'd already carried out attacks. So what we need to see is these promises actually implemented and for Khartoum and all the rebel groups to attend these talks and make a serious effort towards negotiating a peace deal. We've been speaking with Selena Brewer with Human Rights Watch. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. This program was co-produced by Pauline Bartoloni. For a CD copy of this program, call the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736. Or you can get our podcast at radioproject.org. Lisa Rudman is our executive director. Khan Pham, associate director. Tina Rubio, executive producer. Puck Lowe, associate producer. Elena Botkin-Levy, production coordinator. And Lakeisha Thomas, intern. And I'm Andrew Stelzer. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We're on a mission. We're building a lasting institution for women, people of color, and under the resource community using mass communications and art as means to empowerment. Right. Learn many of skills and gain access to the radio. Yeah.
Yes. The KPFA Apprenticeship Program is on a mission. The Apprenticeship Program is an intensive 18-month training program, and new applications are currently being accepted. Call 510-848-6767, extension 235, or email